Yeah. Okay, so uh, today we have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Gana Rojovna, Rojova, oh, sorry. Um, she's an associate professor um, at the Medical Center Utrecht, and uh, her focus is on infectious disease uh, modeling. And today uh, she will talk about model-based evaluation of uh, school and non-school related measures to control the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, so whenever you're ready. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to present as far as I understand that uh, there will be also maybe some researchers uh, uh, from the North America, which is, uh, would be very nice. Uh, I think we, we don't mix that well sometimes in Europe with uh, the American researchers. So, um, let me, okay. So, uh, like many other groups, uh, we have started to work uh, much more uh, together on COVID. And uh, here I present a, a list of collaborators who contributed to the work that I will present today. And they are split between two groups. It's uh, people from the uh, colleagues uh, from the University Medical Center Utrecht um, and from the group led by Miriam Kretschmar, um, which is uh, focuses on infectious disease modeling and also my collaborators from the University of Lisbon where I defended my PhD in 2010. Mm -hmm. And uh, most importantly, we have people on our team, both from Portugal and the Netherlands that are uh, in some sense involved in the policy making. It's Manuel Gomes, and he's a, uh, a member of the vaccination, COVID vaccination committee in Portugal. And uh, he actually made it that our project is supported uh, by the Ministry of Health. And also uh, Mark Bonton is a, uh, a member of the outbreak management team in the Netherlands. And so who provides advice directly to the government on the measures. So uh, uh, I will present two studies. I split them like study one and study two. The first one, which is actually coincides with the title of the talk, it was already published um, uh, sure, in, in March, I guess, uh, just last month in the beginning of March. And uh, that was ma mainly the work done uh, by myself. Uh, and um, the second study, uh, the second study, uh, it's now been under review in Nature Communications, but I, well, by what it looks, it will be published uh, also pretty soon. And that's the work that was done by my student, Joan Viana. And it's available also on Research Square and Med Archive, and we share all our codes on the GitHub if you want to look in the details. And well, because of the importance of this topic, also all this research got quite, actually quite a lot of attention from the media in both countries. So let's move on. So the first study, I called it Schools, the Netherlands in short, and uh, to provide you with the background. So we started this study at the, in, uh, we, we conducted this study in um, uh, late autumn last year when Netherlands was going through the second wave uh, of uh, COVID. And uh, uh, the special, uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion on going on what, what, you know, what is the importance of schools in transmission? What is the importance of school-based contacts and school-based measures? And um, how, uh, and the discussion was going on whether we should actually close schools or not at that point and uh, how to do that, uh, that uh, COVID stays under control, but uh, uh, schools still continue to be open. So in this uh, study, we looked at, um, we addressed a few research questions, which I summarized here. And these are, well, what are the effects of school-based measures, uh, including the school closure during the course of the pandemic? Uh, how do other contacts in the society, so not in the schools, but in the outside uh, of the school environment, need to be reduced to keep schools open? Uh, so that we can still have, uh, uh, so that we can keep the schools open and um, uh, uh, have the control of the pandemic. And what is the importance of different school ages and transmission? And uh, well, I'm infectious disease modeler, so we use transmission models. And the model that we used is a pretty basic model. Uh, you'll probably recognize it's just SEIR type of model. It's age structured, so each individual, so this is indicated by the index K which denotes the age group. And then the individuals, they move from the susceptible state. So it uh, contains everybody who has not experienced COVID into the latent state. So these are individuals who have uh, been infected, but not yet infectious. Then they, you move through um, uh, with a certain rate uh, to a different, uh, to the first infectious stage and progress through the infection stages. 
And in this stage, you can infect others, uh, which is shown by this red arrow. So that uh, th these are the individuals who contribute to the force of infection. And then um, uh, from this infectious stage, uh, it's either you recover. Um, so if you had a mild disease or uh, was were completely asymptomatic, you recover. And uh, it was small probability you can also be hospitalized in any of these stages with a certain rate. So this is the model. Um, it's, um, it contains, uh, uh, it's, it's done for 10 age, well, it's a general model, but we have uh, done it uh, for 10 age classes and we uh, used age eight hospitalization classes as just a slight difference because there are very few hospitalizations in, and very uh, young children. And then also the, what are the essential features? So for example, the susceptibility of individuals uh, uh, of different ages different. So when we use three susceptibility classes, assuming that the susceptibility, for example, of children, adults and elderly can be different. Uh, then we also use the three infectious classes and also the uh, meaning of these infectious classes is that the infectiousness is actually the same in all of them. It's not different, it's the same. But what it allows us to do, it allows us to change the distribution of the infectious period uh, from the exponential. So if there would be one compartment, it's just basic exponential distribution to more gamma-like or more peak distribution. So if you would use infinite number of stages, basically they converge to the limit when they have a fixed infectious period for everybody. And we fit this model um, to data, uh, uh, formally fitted to data and to, to do two data sources, uh, serological and hospitalization age certified data in a Bayesian framework. And I just uh, show the equations, nothing fancy. They are just uh, ordinary differential equations. And the observation model uh, is developed uh, for two data sources and that one is stochastic. So we use also the contact uh, matrices. I guess maybe many of you already know what that is, but it, uh, basically because it's age structured model, we need to know how many infection relevant contacts people make per day uh, in the population. And we use the data that was uh, collected for the Netherlands uh, uh, throughout uh, the pandemic. Uh, there was a baseline contact matrices collected in 2016 and 17. And then this uh, uh, contact data was collected after the first wave and, uh, and so on, it continued. So here I show only the contact matrix before the pandemic and after the uh, first wave. And each element shows the number of contacts a, a person of a, in a, of a given age, for example, five to 10 year old uh, makes with individuals from, uh, from another age. And what you can see is, for example, that there are a lot of contacts. So it's like has a diagonal pattern before the pandemic because children, for example, they have a lot of contacts with each other in school. So 10 to 20 and so on. And then when the, um, and there are a few contacts in off diagonal elements. And uh, so this uh, data also was used after the lockdown. And uh, what we know is that the contacts were on average reduced by 70% by the lockdown in the Netherlands and much more reduced uh, in children than in adult population because the schools got closed. And this is a school specific matrix. I have to move on. And one thing that I think that we do differently from other modelers is that we actually estimate how this transition happens from before the, the lockdown uh, into the lockdown. Instead of imposing that it happened on certain day, what we do is that we estimate the, uh, the let's say the mean date when that transition happened because there are a few changes that uh, a few uh, specific uh, rules that were introduced or, uh, or guidelines in the population or restrictions. And we estimate also the speed with which it was done. So whether it happened very fast or whether it happened within a day or whether there was actually a range of a couple of weeks which it was done. So this is estimated in the model. And we do this by uh, writing down the contact trait, which is CKL of uh, individual in age group K with individuals in age, uh, sorry, in age group K with individuals in age group L. Uh, as a linear combination of matrices before the lockdown, BKL and AKL after the lockdown. And the coefficients, <clears throat> sorry, of this linear coefficient are given by just one minus F of T times F of T, where F of T is a simple logistic function, which is defined by two parameters, uh, the slope and the midpoint transition. And the K1 and T1, they are estimated. And here in gray, I show that a few trajectories 
estimated trajectory and also the median estimated trajectory. And in the same way, if we extend this, uh, sorry, there was also uh, one more parameter, so the, the zeta one, which I didn't explain. And it, it says basically that, okay, while we collected the data after the lockdown, people may report a contact. For example, they say, well, I had a contact, but what they don't report is that they might have used a mask at that point, for example. So the actual number of contacts, uh, uh, infection relevant contacts can be lower. And that is accounted by this parameter zeta one, which is also estimated. And we can, uh, we can continue this and we can extend this approach to look at how the relaxation of the lockdown happens for example and when we open schools how the contact structure happens using this type of approach so in the model what we estimate is that we estimate that the susceptibility actually changes with age and we use the our reference group is everybody who is above 60 so the 60 plus and we estimate the susceptibility of 0 to 20 year old children relative to 60 plus individuals is roughly 23 percent and uh, the susceptibility of 20 to 60 year old uh, individuals is uh, around uh, 61%. So this is not, uh, uh, this is a rather in agreement with uh, other studies and some of them they're just observational studies which also show uh, that the susceptibility increases with age in the population. And we estimate that the probability of hospitalization in different age groups, which are actually shown on the X axis here, zero to 20 and so 120 to 30, 80 plus, it increases almost exponentially uh, uh, with age. Uh, so the y-axis is shown the log scale. So you see that it's almost a line. So it's the older you are, the much higher you have the chance of, uh, of being hospitalized. And we estimate that this ranges from 0.1% for the lo uh, lowest, uh, youngest individuals to 4.4% uh, in the 80 plus age category. And this is actually the model fit that we obtain. And um, uh, you see in each panel, you see the number of hospitalizations per day in a given age group. The age group is shown on top of each panel. So we go from the youngest until the oldest and here are the 80 plus. Of course, in the youngest individuals, you have fewer hospitalizations. So it looks more like, um, yeah, it, um, that there is, let's say, less clear pattern, but when you go to all the individuals, you see a clear pattern. And uh, so the, the red dots are the data and the black dots, the, the, the black dot, the, the thick black line is the median trajectory in the model. And this gray uh, shaded region is the Bayesian prediction interval. So we have a quite agreement between the model and the data. And uh, we also have very good agreement for the seroprevalence in the model, which is shown um, the, in the model is shown as a, um, as a proport uh, as a, this uh, red uh, violins or uh, shaded regions. And then uh, the, the data is shown itself as a dot with a confidence interval. So it fits quite well. Then uh, what we did next is that we want to look at uh, public health control measures. In particular, we look at the measures that uh, by splitting them you know, in two types, the measures that are targeted at children and the measures that are targeted at the rest of the population. And the aim of almost uh, yeah, all measures nowadays is to try to keep the effective reproduction number below one. I think everybody knows it already from the TV and so on. And uh, um, the effective reproduction number is just, uh, it's an average number of, uh, of, of secondary cases one person generates uh, in the population during the infectious period. And um, E denotes us that there can be just also people who are not susceptible in the population anymore due to being infected before. And here in, uh, below you see the, the timeline of the Dutch pandemic. It's a schematic, it's just a schematic where the pandemic started roughly in the beginning of, uh, at the end of February of past year and the schools were open, which is shown in lime green. Then the schools closed uh, in mid-March with the introduction of the lockdown and they stayed closed with, a very, with the exception of a very short uh, period when they opened before closing again because of school holidays. And then uh, schools opened also somewhere at the end of August and stayed open until uh, until the point when we were, let's say, uh, submitting our work. So, and RE changed also roughly from 2.7, that's what we estimate to during the lockdown to 2.6. And there were two time points which were very interesting to us. 
The first was uh, when the schools just opened, when this RE was 1.31 estimate, so it was larger than one. And then uh, the point, um, let's say at the end of November, the RE was reduced due to other measures in the population to almost one, but it was very hard to push it really below one. That's why there was a lot of ongoing discussion. Actually, what's the impact of schools? Should the schools be closed, etc.? So um, we look at uh, two uh, at scenarios which are uh, decreasing the school contacts um, uh, up to, you know, just decreasing the school contacts due to measures like more online education, making different shifts up to the complete school closure, while we keep the rest of the, the contacts and the rest of the society fixed, let's say we don't introduce any other measures. And uh, the second scenario at which we look is uh, decreasing these uh, non-school contacts until the level of April 2020. And April 2020 is the uh, when it, it's, it's believed to be probably the, the lowest uh, level of contacts that you can achieve in the population. This is the first lockdown, the most strict and the first lockdown when the population was most compliant. And uh, if you don't uh, change and we, in this scenario, we would also keep the school contacts fixed, so we don't change anything in the schools. And we look at uh, two different time points uh, when RE was 1.3 at the end of August and schools just opened. And when RE was reduced to one, but it was harder to reduce it further and, and schools were open. And this is what we see. Uh, we look at this effective reproduction number and how it changes, how it would change when we reduce, for example, other contacts in the society in April 2020. So one, or we want to be below one, let's say, so this is the blue line. We start with 1.3, which is shown by this red line. And the green line it indicates what's the lowest level of uh, uh, that you can get to uh, by reducing the contacts in the society from the level of August 2020. And if you would go um, um, and if you would re reduce them until the level of uh, April 2020, so the most strict lockdown. And you can see that you would need to reduce, at that point, you would still need to implement measures that reduce contacts by approximately 60% uh, to get the RE below one. And uh, uh, the maximum effect would be if you, if you reduce them until the level of April 2020, then RE would be roughly 0.8. The shaded region are just uh, the confidence intervals. And the same, well, what would happen if in August, for example, the schools did not open, the schools open, but if they did not open and we, if we kept the schools closed, and uh, what we see is that if you reduce the scorned contacts by 100%, so basically schools just, uh, yeah, there are no contacts at schools at all, then we see that we would go from 1.3 uh, only until 1.18. So we could reduce the RE only by a relatively small amount, which would be 10%. So, and it would, the RE would still stay above one. So the second wave that was going on in the Netherlands, it would not be possible to prevent that wave by just closing schools. Uh, then we do the same exercise for November. At the moment we were, when we were writing this study, when RE was uh, about one, uh, at that point, and we look also at two different situations, how this effective reproduction number would change if you reduce the contacts by almost 100 percent. So we, uh, uh, at that point in the rest of the society or in schools. So in, on the right hand side, you see the reduction in schools. So this point corresponds to closing schools completely. And this point corresponds to uh, reducing um, the contacts in the rest of the society up to the level of April 2020 and keeping the schools open. And you see that the impact, uh, so the impact of each of these uh, measures uh, separately, uh, uh, targeted both at schools and at uh, everything else but schools and the rest of the society, it's approximately similar. So they both, they reduce uh, RE from one roughly 0 0.84 or 85. So the same impact at that point would be expected um, by either introducing measures in the rest of the society and in schools. And this is important, actually quite important because uh, this contro controversy like whether uh, schools can actually help to reduce, you know, or change the situation at that point, uh, it, uh, it was necessary to understand this. Then we further looked at the impact of different school ages because uh, it's not clear, you know, 
or it's becoming ever more clear that, for example, that the different school ages, they don't make the same contribution to transmission. Uh, one thing that is important for considering different school ages is how many contacts children actually have at school. And another uh, important factor is how susceptible these children are. So uh, we looked at, uh, separately, what if we would, uh, let's say, reduce contacts only among children um, uh, who are between zero and five years of age, so basically the kindergarten, uh, um, and then um, uh, children between five to 10 years of age and 10 to 20 years of age. And we see that, for example, the uh, reducing contacts among zero to five year old children makes basically negligible contribution to reducing the effective reproduction number. It doesn't almost change because these children, they are the least susceptible, but they also don't have that many contacts as, for example, and this as a 10 to 20 year old age group. And the 10 to 20 year old age group in particular, uh, reducing contacts in this age group, it's basically explains most of the, uh, most of the reduction that you can in general, achieve in the population by targeting schools. So the older schools, uh, kids are most important. So let me um, continue. So that's uh, the conclusion. So I will just go be very brief. So the older school uh, kids are most important in transmission and also uh, uh, closing schools after the summer break probably would not prevent the second wave, would not have prevented the second wave uh, in the Netherlands in autumn 2020. And the impact of, uh, of school-based measures, it depends on actually what's going on with the non-school-based ba measures where your RE level is. So I will move on to the second study. I will not go in so much detail into the study. I'll just say that it focuses on the vaccination in Portugal. Um, the background is that, well, in Portugal, there were three waves of COVID-19 until the moment vaccination started at the end of 2020 like in many countries, and still the government also struggles to choose the right mix of measures to keep the COVID under control. And we were interested in um, looking at the impact of vaccination or, or, on transmission and specifically wanted to answer when and which control measures can be relaxed as the vaccination is rolled out. So that's the most pressing question nowadays. And uh, well, we again use the transmission model. It's the same transmission model as before, was the only difference that there is also vaccination in the model. So all people from the susceptible, exposed, recovered, and well, hospitalized, they can be, um, uh, they can be vaccinated. So they go in the vaccinated compartments. And then there is also the progression. So the susceptible individuals, they have reduced susceptibility after vaccination. So they can also progress to exposed, infected and so on. And the vaccine has uh, three effects. Uh, the first effect of vaccine is reducing the susceptibility. So it's in actually infection blocking. The second effect of vaccine is reducing the infectivity. It's not shown, but it means that these people who are in this box IV, so uh, who, those who get infected despite being vaccinated, uh, they have a, a lower infectiousness as compared to these uh, naive individuals. They may have lower infectiousness as compared to those individuals. And then also, if you were vaccinated, uh, then uh, uh, that your probability of getting hospitalized is reduced. And this is shown by the reduction in the, in the uh, hospitalization rate. Um, we also fit it to the same data sources, but for a much longer period. And we extend uh, this to make these different transitions because this is not just the first wave, as you can see. So the, the, the red dots are the, the hospital admissions in different age groups. And the black line, again, the model and the gray regions are the uh, prediction, bias and prediction intervals from the model. So you see uh, that there was a first uh, wave uh, and then there was a low epidemic activity through the summer in the past um, year. And then there was, a, was the beginning opening of schools at the end of August, there was a, 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 the started a, second bigger wave started, which was slightly curbed by the measures. But then at the end of the year, because of Christmas and New Year holidays, again, the measures uh, were slightly relaxed and a new third wave started. And we also fit this basically to the seroprevalence data and estimate how the number or the seroprevalence changes in the population with time. And 
by the beginning of January, we estimate that roughly 19% of people who, uh, must have had COVID already. So uh, what we do in this work, we estimate how the contact structure has changed throughout the time due to different measures, and we estimate the different transition points. So this green lines, uh, they show uh, different estimated median transition times. And um, we show, for example, that the, uh, the average contact rate is just a summary measure. It changed from 12 something contacts per day before the pandemic, then it dropped very much to roughly four, and then was increased due to the relaxation after the first wave. So this is the summer level, which stayed almost constant. And then because of opening in schools, it increased again and so on. So we estimate this. And we estimate also how the, the dependent time uh, uh, effective reproduction number changed uh, through time. And this is also dropped and, uh, you know, due to introduction of measures. And then it's uh, stayed uh, almost uh, below one, but very close to one through summer and was increased and so on. So, um, uh, so what we would like to know when we relax measures, instead of implementing like new measures, we say, what if we uh, now, uh, Portugal was in the lockdown and we ask, what if we relax measures as in summer 2020 to this, so that the contacts increase to the same level or what if you relax measures in, as in autumn 2020? Um, of course, now the vaccination is going on and we took the vaccine, actual vaccination plan that was developed by the government before the start of vaccination, where there are like different phases, so it's quite detailed, there are different age groups that were vaccinated, different periods, and uh, different categories of people, and we used the data uh, from the Ministry of Health, so for example, the categories of people who were priority, uh, who had priority for vaccination, for example, those who had cardiac insufficiency or coronary heart disease or, or other morbidities, so we used this information about how about the age distribution of these diseases in the population and the actual vaccination plan uh, to calculate uh, how the vaccination rate would be uh, changing throughout the year, so to project it. And this is, a, uh, this is um, the projected vaccination rate, so this is the number of people vaccinated per day. Uh, in the uh, number of people vaccinated uh, per day. And you see that it, uh, in the beginning, uh, we expect, so it's stratified here for simplicity just in three groups. So for example, in the 60 plus age category, the people would be vaccinated in the first place because these are elderly uh, people in the elderly homes and also most of the people who have different morbidities, these are in older age groups. But also there are some uh, younger people because uh, the healthcare workers, for example, they are younger, they have usually age between 20 and 60. So we use this to project how the vaccination coverage will uh, increase in the population. And um, yeah, I don't have much time. I think we can just uh, focus probably on the right hand side. So this is the total vaccination coverage, how it would be uh, changing. So by end of May, there would be, uh, yeah, I don't know, 10%, 9% of, yeah, 9% of individuals would be vaccinated overall, and then 38% by uh, 1st of uh, August, and then at the end, the vaccination coverage can be up to 73%. And these are actually the data, the actual vaccination data, which I haven't updated for a little bit, but it doesn't differ very much from, uh, from what we project. So there is a slightly higher coverage for one dose because there is intention to vaccinate the largest number of people with just one dose and slightly lower for two doses. So um, I have about two slides. So we look at uh, different relaxation scenarios and these relaxation scenarios, uh, as I said, they are based on what we estimated in the past. So we say, well, the one is very basic. What if, if you lift all measures completely in the society, what will happen? Um, the second scenario is that if we partially lift the measures as, a, as they were in autumn 2020, when schools opened, but still other measures were kept in place. And then the scenario three, if the measures are relaxed as in summer, basically when school stays closed, but there were also some other measures in place. And the scenario four is a stepwise relaxation of measures. So uh, stepwise, it means that we do uh, a relaxation in sequence. So first we do scenario three. So we relax this in summer, then as an autumn, and then uh, we go finally relaxed all the measures. 
And I will show only one scenario, which is already quite a, a favorable scenario where we have this three step approach. So in the first uh, graph, you see the hospitalization. So it's um, so these are the hospitalizations, the dots are the data, and that's what we project. And then we say that the measures are relaxed in April, 1st of June and 1st of October, so that the contact rate increases uh, to the level of summer of autumn 2020. And then finally, on 1st of October, we lift all measures completely. So we go to the pre-pandemic contacts. And uh, we estimate, uh, uh, so I, uh, this uh, timings, they're intentionally chosen to show that the, you can relax the measures but the hospitalizations can stay low. As you can see that they are, well, they are very close to zero. They are comparable to last summer when the situation was very much manageable, the summer of uh, uh, last year. So that's what I call low epidemic activity. But um, the RE, we see that it would still go up after the relaxation shown by these blue lines. It would still go up slightly. And then in the second part, it would slow uh, go up slightly. So it, it doesn't increase hospitalizations, but there is definitely circulation. And uh, I, if I had time, I could show graphs like with the total number of cases, but it doesn't lead to hospitalization because uh, most vulnerable populations would have been vaccinated already by that point. And, and we have, uh, and we also estimate what, we, what would be the uh, proportion of the population, which is shown on the Y axis, uh, uh, which would be protected through the natural infection, so those who just had the infection, and those who would be protected through the vaccination, how it would change in this scenario. And we see that roughly 48% of individuals by the end of, uh, sorry, by 1st of October, it almost doesn't change. They would be protected through the vaccination and the rest, uh, they would be protected through the natural infection. This is, uh, by the way, you may ask how happens that this is 48% protected through the vaccination if the vaccination coverage is expected to be, you know, about 70% uh, by this point. Uh, this is because we assume that when you give vaccine to people who already had the infection, which is the current guideline, if you already had the infection, you uh, you're still uh, you still should vaccinate. That there, yeah, that basically uh, it's uh, uh, it doesn't provide. In reality, it does provide some uh, additional protection, but in the model, it doesn't because we assume that uh, after you recover, you cannot be reinfected, and. Um, I, I well, I will not go in this scenario, but I will probably go to the conclusions so I can give you more details if you will be interested. Is that uh, if the measures would be relaxed too quickly, then we can see the you know the new waves into 2021, and uh, we need still to have uh, keep substantial measures throughout 2020, 2021 to to have the situation manageable, and more favorable scenarios when we, the the measures are relaxed in a stepwise manner, or if they are relaxed as in some of the past year when there were when there was no outbreak. And uh, another option, of course, for many countries is increasing vaccination rates, but uh, this scenario doesn't seem to be at least feasible uh, for Portugal. Um, yeah, at least up until this moment, they have not been able to increase the vaccination rates with respect to what they projected. And I think at this point, I'd like to thank and I'll be happy to answer your questions. All right. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, so of course, if there are questions in the audience, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Uh, you can uh, maybe raise hand. I think you can, you can do that. And, uh, and I can give you uh, the uh, uh, speech, can I say? But, uh, anyway, um, so one thing I would like to ask before, maybe before it starts, um, something I caught in your first study um is how how you how you can measure the um, uh, the impact of the the, the uh, closure of uh, schools for a particular age range this i uh, oh yeah i didn't uh, really understand yeah i will go back let me see um let me see. So uh, one thing that we need to do, mm -hmm. I didn't go in detail. So we have this school contact structure mm -hmm. that was measured. 
And yes. this contact structure, it uh, gives the number of contacts between uh, different individuals. Here, as you can see, they can be, uh, for example, kids with kids, but there can be also kids with teachers. So I, it, it mm -hmm. mostly shown in yellow, but they also have contacts. So, for example, you can have five to 10 year old uh, uh, kids with uh, all the teachers, but there are also teachers with teachers. So what we need to do is that we need to split this matrix into three according to whether these contacts take place in, uh, in uh, uh, schools for like zero to five year olds or five to 10 year olds or 10 to 20 year olds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. is, it, uh, is it clear? And then you need, well, um, to do that, obviously that uh, uh, the contacts, for example, for kids five to 10 year old, they, uh, they was five to 10 year old, they, uh, they take place in, um, uh, in, uh, for example, in these schools for five to 10 year old, and also with all the other ages, these are uh, contacts of kids with uh, teachers of different ages. Mm -hmm. So you split like that. And also the same uh, for, um, uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for the column. And the, uh, the contacts uh, for the teachers with teachers, we split proportionally to the number of students because you know what's the number of, what is the demography in your population. So uh, you know how many students of, uh, or kids of zero, um, uh, between zero and five years of age, five and 10 years of age and 10 to, of 20 that there are in the population. And we say that the number of contacts between teachers is proportional to the number of, uh, uh, to the number of, uh, of uh, students of that age. So basically what you do is that you split this matrix into three and you say that it's additive. It's an assumption, I mean, it's an, a very rough approximation, but we have to work with it because there is no more detailed data uh, yeah, within the specific schools and so on. It's very scarce. So that was how it was done. And then you can, well, what you say is that when you evaluate the impact of different schools, you say, well, what if the contacts keep on happening in uh, within uh, within one type of school, but the other two we, we switch off, for example? Mm -hmm. So that what was done, and we were um, keeping one school uh, closed and the other two open. And I see. Yeah. Okay, so you work with uh, already existing data, and but uh, there is no confirmation from uh, looking at the, the evolution of the incidence rate, for instance, or something like that. No, but that, that, that would be very difficult. <laughs> um, it's, um, yeah, this is a population based study. Mm. I'm actually involved in one work we are, where we are working with the data actually from mm -hmm. schools, also within schools, like what are the number of kids getting infected and so on. But this was not, uh, yeah, this was not formally fit to, to the rates of, uh, you know, the incidents in schools, for example. All this model, it was fit to hospitalization rates only in uh, different age groups. And the serology in in the different well serology is that the proportion of people who had the disease in a different in a given age category. Mm. Okay, and uh, so in in in, um, in this evaluation, I guess you have to uh, you have to assume um, that the transmissibility the, something about the transmissibility of the disease between age groups. So maybe it's just a constant. Uh, um, yeah, you... so in, indeed, uh, um, it's important that um, um, that the, the the susceptibility. So when you when you have mm -hmm. a given age and you didn't have uh, COVID, what is your susceptibility of getting uh, the disease? Mm -hmm. And the susceptibility, uh, it's 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 like it's a biological, let's say, more feature. I don't know what is the actually the biological underpinning, but mm -hmm. for example, the, the kids seem to be much less susceptible than uh, elderly. So the elderly get the disease, uh, you know, the susceptibility is higher. And this is what we also estimate uh, that this susceptibility. I mean, we don't estimate it within the age groups. We could probably also do that, but we estimate in the broad age groups, like that the mm -hmm. zero to twenty year olds, that it's lower than in the rest of, of in the 20 to 60 year olds. Um, so, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, okay, okay. So, yeah. so of course this, this is, uh, I, I guess this is based on, um, on the expression of symptoms. So that there could be a bias if, uh, for instance, younger children express less symptoms than, uh, than elder people, right? 
so they could get get the disease and uh, and be covered cases, but still transmit, uh, still still be able to transmit like anyone else. You see what yeah, I mean? The number of uh, it's true that the number of uh, asymptomatic individuals it seems to be much larger among kids than among uh, adults. So basically, the, mm -hmm. the older you become, also the higher chance that you develop symptoms and severe disease. Uh, that's uh, that's true that uh, that happens. But um, I think in, uh, in our study, it's, it's not biased in that way because we base um, our work on hospitalizations and hospitalizations, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's true for, you know, for everybody. So you don't get, it's not based on the case notification data where you can have like under reporting, for example, in kids, just because many more of them are symptomatic or so. Um, um. This, mm. or maybe you can ask again what was yeah yeah I, I, i'm not i'm not completely convinced by by your answer because uh you know still if you know um if if you if asymptomatics can contribute to uh to the propagation of the disease then that can that can bias in a way the the uh the way the this is spreads in the population, so uh, yeah. this this could a little, this could induce a bias. I mean, in, in the in the in the the effect of the so the measure of the effect of the the, the closure of schools, for instance. So, if if you, for instance, if you assume that uh, asymptomatic children can transmit the disease, then maybe the closure of uh, schools will, will have a larger impact than uh, if you just. Um, Based your your study on, on the data, which shows that uh, no no kids are infected. Do, do you see what I mean? Not quite. Not I think <laughs> um, uh, in um, because I mean actually the, the, the measures that I introduced they mm -hmm. work by reducing the contact rate. I mean whether you are symptomatic or not, it's just like you you block contacts between people. So when the schools are closed, you say that the contacts just don't play take place and whether mm. kids are symptomatic or symptomatic, it doesn't matter. The same thing that happens with the rest of the society when we stay at home, it just reduces uh, our uh, contact rate in, 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 in the population. Okay, so, so if, you, if, you, if you, you look at it another way, um, if, if you want to, to search for efficient measures that are, so of course, if you reduce the contact, the contact rate for everyone, then you, stop the, you can stop the disease. But maybe yeah. it's too much, right? Maybe uh, maybe you don't need to uh, to to stop everyone from meeting to uh, to reduce the, the propagation uh, speed, actually. Yeah. And so, so you don't so... want to reduce it for everyone. You mm. you you want to reduce it by some amount, but but not too much, let's say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, so so this is uh, where it would be interesting to have some uh, ex additional information on uh, how. Um, People, you know, how how uh, people can transmit the disease uh, depending on their age group, in a way. So so that that was uh, why why I was interesting in in your answer. But uh, but uh, I, um, I, hmm? um, but that's because uh, yeah I didn't show but it's it's age structured model and it mm -hmm. actually estimates how the disease is transmitted exactly in age structured way. I would say in an age structured population, mm -hmm. it's not uh, it's not a model where you have, uh, uh, let's say, just uh, susceptible or infected or uh, like recovered, but which don't have age assigned to them. Mm -hmm. So you look at how, for example, so here you would look at how susceptible uh, people like children, for example, if you think K, uh, like children, zero to 20 year old, for example, mm -hmm. how they would be infected by uh, are they infected children or are they infected adults? So this is all um, like integrate. If I show these equations, for example, so here the susceptible SK is a susceptible mm -hmm. in age group K and they get infected at some ra rate lambda K. So this is the, the how they decrease due to infection. And this lambda K, it depends. Um, uh, so this is the force of infection. It depends on the contact rate in the population between age group K and L. So how many contacts actually the susceptible person will have with infected person in age group L. 
uh, and the proportion of uh, infected people in, uh, in uh, age group L, actually. So what mm -hmm. is the chance that you have actually contact with an, uh, with an infected person times uh, the probability tra of transmission per contact? Mm -hmm. So, so um, yeah, I didn't explain this. I thought maybe this is uh, too obvious or too uh, trivial somehow. Yeah, but it, it does involve completely age structured transmission. And here, moreover, uh, so epsilon as estimated, a C is taken from, from the data that uh, we collected, that was collected. And uh, um, the beta, it's this susceptibility, reduced susceptibility that we also estimate uh, relative to the oldest age category. So if individuals in age class uh, S, if they are um, less susceptible, this factor will be less than one. So it's just a parameter between zero and one that is estimated. Okay, I, I think uh, maybe, maybe I, I, I lost my point, but uh, that's fine. Um, any, any other question? Yeah, please. Yeah. I, I cannot hear you. So. Quentin, you need to allow. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. OK. Right. Yeah. Uh, Hanna, I don't see in your model the reinfection. No, no reinfection. Um, yeah, what, what do you think? The next question is, what do you think about the third and uh, second and third waves of pandemia? Uh, what is, it, is it a result of um, reinfection or uh, this is a result of new cases uh, for absolutely for susceptibles, uh, not for recovered uh, yeah. people? What do you think about the second and third waves of pandemia? Do you in, have information? In Portugal. Or in uh, uh, I don't know. You show us uh, <laughs> graphs with uh, second and short waves. I think that in many countries, not only in Portugal. Yeah. So uh, there is no indeed there is no reinfection in the model. So here it assumes that as as, as long as you end up in this R box, so you recovered. So you, you have a permanent immunity. And this has been shown all, all already that this is not true. Like for many other respiratory infections, so the immunity is waning and with time we can get reinfected. What was also shown um, uh, for, for SARS-CoV-2 specifically is that these antibodies that protect us from reinfection, they last uh, on a time scale of several months to several years. So it's not a super fast process. So you're not expected to be reinfected, you know, a couple of weeks after, after you just had infection of, of, I mean, the majority of the population, of course, if you have a very bad health and like some problems that might happen. Uh, so um, uh, there were studies also done in uh, not mathematical modeling studies, but done in Denmark, for example, where data was compared for people who were just doing regular testing throughout uh, you know, the pandemic and during the first and second wave. And the reinfection rates uh, uh, were determined, but they were not so high. So it, it's taking place, but they are not so high. So uh, it's, not, uh, um, it's not the driver, uh, it's not the driver Currently, I think it's not the driver in Europe, the reinfection. The driver for the second wave, at least in Portugal, it's, it's, it's also not approved, but the driver was obviously in many countries like Portugal and the Netherlands, the school opening and the associated changes in the rest of the society. Because when you open schools, also the parents have to move more, they have more activities and so on, so they have to go around. So that uh, contributed a lot to the second wave. And um, uh, also the um, uh, compliance was decreasing with the measures uh, in, uh, in, in many countries, like now in the Netherlands, for example, it's very hard to keep a population compliant. So basically the measures are very strict, but uh, it doesn't work anymore because people don't uh, want to stay anymore in the lockdown. And it's, um, it's, it, it is not caused Luckily for us, it's not caused by the uh, reinfection yet. 
Um, I can give you one example where in the other places in the world where it might have been caused by the reinfection, and that was in Brazil. There is a place which is called Man Manaus. So there was the reinfection rates have been determined. Well, there was a very large, severe second wave. And uh, I don't know whether it's now clear what it was attributed to that wave at this point, but at least some time ago, it was not clear. It might have been due to reinfection because at that point it was believed that the uh, level of, uh, of uh, immunity in the population was already so high. So the proportion of people who already recovered from the disease was very high, close to the theoretical herd immunity threshold, but still the second wave was happening. And they, they associate that, to, that reinfection to new emergent variants. So they had the variant, which is called the Brazilian variant, P1. And uh, they think that my, it might have started to spread there and it caused the reinfection in people who already had the uh, prior infection with a, a different variant. But in Europe, that's not the major cause. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, reinfection contributes to transmission, but also the human immune system, it works in the way that after you had infection at least once, or you were vaccinated once with at least one dose, I think, that your chance of severe diseases will be ex so much lower. So you may get infected like was a, you know, was more common cold illness, but you will not develop very severe disease and you will not be uh, hospitalized again. And that we can actually check because we have uh, the hospitalization data for Portugal for uh, like nearly a year now. And we can see we have also, it's, um, it's pseudo anonymous. So we have individuals, we don't know their identities, but we can see whether there are individuals who were readmitted to hospital with a very different, uh, you know, uh, with uh, some uh, many months in between, for example. So um, I mean, you can be admitted to hospital and be transferred, that's one thing, but with many months in between, and we see that that number is very small. So it's a small percentage of people who gets readmitted to hospital after having COVID once. And the second question, in biology, there is a hypos uh, hypothesis that uh, virus, um, tries to save the life of host cell because the host cell provides very, very comfortable condition for virus yeah. like house like for aging <laughs> and uh, there is a absolutely natural process when virus uh, lost uh, their uh, virulence. Yeah. I mean that uh, uh, strengths of infection. And uh, we can uh, we can see and uh, biologists uh, know a lot of evidences that some uh, infectious diseases can uh, go out uh, when pandemic decreases and it's an absolute natural process because mutation of virus uh, leads to the <clears throat> uh, behavioral changing in the vir uh, behavioral changing in virus population. Uh, I can repeat, virus uh, try to save the life of yeah, yeah, I understand you completely. Yeah. Yes, okay. And uh, we can see that uh, the decreasing of pandemia may deal with the absolutely natural process of virus mutation. Yeah. What do you think about this? Yeah, I, I know what, what, what you, uh, I think what you were saying is that uh, the virus evolves so that uh, on one side, the virus wants to be more transmissible to increase the transmissibility so that it can uh, be transmitted faster. And on the other side, to reduce the virulence because the virulence means that you kill the host and using which you basically replicate. And the increase in transmission is, uh, is that you can spread to more people. So um, this process I think is well known. And I think also theoretically quite well studied is that there should be an 
sort of optimum at what you should be transmissibility and what your uh, virulence should be so that you can transmit in the most efficient way in a, in a sense. Uh, I just uh, last uh, Monday, I just attended a, a talk uh, in the Newton uh, Institute, Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge, where I also gave, gave a talk myself in the workshop and it was devoted exactly to, uh, well, vaccination and evolution. I'm not the biggest expert on this, but uh, for example, the examples that were shown, uh, you know that the British variant that is now spreading in France, for example, and is spreading in the Netherlands and in Portugal, it's more transmissible. That was shown that it's more transmissible, but it was shown that it's also more virulent, surprisingly. So uh, uh, first, uh, the news came that it actually uh, it has higher basic reproduction number in a sense, but then it also basically kills more people. And how that happens, uh, there was a theoretical work that also showed that uh, you can also evolve uh, by reducing, uh, sorry, by increasing both transmission and the virulence as long as your uh, transmissibility is increased enough. So, you know, if you can transmit to five more people and kill only half a person more, that's still more advantageous from an evolutionary perspective than, uh, you know, than uh, not, yeah, it's like a, a trade-off, but it, it can still be advantageous than not killing anybody, for example. Or in comparison, you always have to be compared to other variants that are circulating. So if you consider the wild type variant, so the variant which was the or lineage, which was the most prevalent uh, in France before the British variant came, let's say. And that was, um, I mean, out like an example, uh, uh, had uh, on average could infect uh, three persons, for example, you could infect and uh, would, uh, I don't know, um, cause deaths, for example, in one out of 10,000 people, for example. And if the new variant that is coming, it can infect uh, five people, for example, on average, and uh, cause uh, death in one out of, uh, I don't know, 5,000 people, that is still more advantageous. So. Yeah, that's what I can tell you. I don't know, I don't think that everybody's understanding how the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 will happen. So now it has been happening quite fast. There are all these variants emerging, but it's not clear whether this is like a first adaptation stage, which will be very fast where the virus will, you know, will do or has done already most of the evolution and then it will evolve much slower. I, I, I don't have answer to, to these questions. I think it's uh, lots of people are, um, yeah, wondering about the same stuff and uh, many biologists and virologists and so on. Okay. okay. Uh, thank, thank you. I think we should, uh, we should stop yeah. here because it's already uh, past time. Yeah. Right. Uh, thank you again, Gana, for uh, participating in our webinar, our very interesting talk. And um, okay, so uh, now it's time to stop the seminar and uh, thank you everyone for participating also. Yeah. Thank All you. right. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.